My name is Dr. Lori Garcia. I'm the principal investigator and director of Project 10, and we're housed at the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg. But as you'll see later, we've got folks working throughout the state of Florida. And then I'll let my co-presenters introduce themselves. Sure, Demetrius. My name is Demetrius Sutherland, and I'm Project 10 senior student. Good afternoon, I'm Danny Roberts, I'm Assistant Director for Project 10 Transition Education Network. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about our mission and initiatives with Project 10. We've got a lot of trainings that we provide throughout the state of Florida to our special education teachers and administrators. And we have a very rich website that's full of resources. And then we'll also talk to you about the Project 10 Stingray program that Demetrius just mentioned to you. We are a statewide discretionary project, and what that means is IDEA funding from the federal government comes through the state of Florida, and it is dispersed out to various projects, and Project 10 is one of those. And you may have seen other projects like Florida Inclusion Network or SEDNET, just to name a few. Um, we have a bees liaison that we work with, and I don't know if any of you saw her presentation, Judy White. She's our secondary transition expert, and we work very closely together with her. So everything that's on our website and all of our trainings, they have to first be approved by the Florida Department of Ed Bureau of Exceptional Education and Student Services, or BEES. So we work very closely. We serve as basically the clearinghouse for secondary transition in the state of Florida. And you'll learn later that there are others who visit our website. Danny will share some statistics with you on just how far-reaching our website is. So we, our primary charge is to prepare our teachers and administrators and other stakeholders in the resources and training and rules, if you will, for secondary transition IEPs, et cetera. When the Project 10 first started, we started by doing needs assessments. So we met with teams across all 67 school districts in the state of Florida that involved the ESC director, their transition contacts, staffing specialists, special ed teachers in high schools and middle schools, and we asked, what do you need from us? Here's your performance on graduation rate, dropout rate, transition IEP compliance, and post-school outcomes for students with disabilities. Where are your strengths? Where are your needs? Here's our trainings and technical assistance that we provide. Let's create a short list. So we started out with a focus on the secondary transition IEP compliance. And it was pretty low when we first started in 2008, 2009. I think around 40, 50% compliance, a lot of things had changed. And so we're now up in, I think it's like 89%. We slipped a little bit with some recent legislative directives that didn't make it into some of the IEPs. When they went back, the districts will pull IEPs randomly and evaluate, do a self-assessment. And that's the data that feeds into the overall state performance. So we continue to improve there, but it's not enough to just have a compliant IEP. As we know, what is most important is where our students end up when they graduate. What kind of experiences and education are we providing with for them when we have them in school to prepare them to be the successful adults, career, college, life ready. And so those are the things we work on. We collaborate with other statewide projects and think about the importance adult agencies play in those transition plans and after a student leaves high school. And I talked a lot about this thing, but we want to build capacity. So it's one thing for us to provide training, but if we want a district or a building administrator or a principal to be able to dig into their graduation data, we've got to teach them how to work with it. It's like teach folks to fish. We're not going to do all the fishing for you. So that gets at the capacity building. We want our folks to be able to operate as independently as possible once they have the skills. And this is our district map. So we have state representation. I started as a regional transition rep in Region 1 and then moved down to St. Pete in Pinellas, we're in there, to become the director and PI for the project. And Turi, we load our regional transition representative positions 
to build a team. So Turi brought with her some recency as a transition specialist, but also as a interagency council coordinator for the Big Bend Transition Council. So she was working with multiple districts already in the panhandle. Similarly with Carly in Region 2 with the recent district experience. We are filling our Region 3 in the green, and that person will start next week, so we'll have an announcement, and we're very excited <coughs> to add that component with some independent living background. Freddie comes to us from vocational <coughs> rehabilitation, so he has the employment background. And then we've got Lisa Friedman Chavez, who's worked with other projects in the past, but one of her areas of strength is the discovery process, which is a really intense person-centered planning with customized employment as an outcome. And that's putting it in a big, or a, quite a nutshell, because it's quite a, a involved process. And let's, let's not forget about our students with emotional behavior disorders and other disabilities that are in our DJJ facilities. And that's where Dr. Rick Casey, our consultant, comes in. So he travels statewide to provide that support. And so we talked about capacity building. I've already touched on interagency collaboration. The key role that we play in legislation and policy is working with our bees liaison together, um, for example, in our new trainings that we've had to update, or our new trainings and then updating our existing trainings to reflect the changes in legislation. So we've had changes for graduation requirements, uh, what about our special diplomas and what's happening with those? So those are our, that's the content that that partnership with our bees liaison is so critical because that's her role to make sure that the information we provide is most accurate. And then student development and outcomes. So one of our trainings is building employability skills for students with disabilities so that we can train our teachers on those skills that are most needed for our students. One of the most important things that we can do for students with disabilities to ensure that they obtain competitive paid employment when they graduate is to help them get those paid experiences while they're still in school. And research, as well as experiences that you'll hear from our star from the scenery program, we'll show you. All right, so we talked about capacity <coughs> building, evidence-based practices. We research and link any of our training content to what we know that is going on nationally that has proven to yield outcomes. I just mentioned what the research has shown about how we can ensure our students have the best possible chance to become employed, and that's to get them paid employment while they're still in school. Similarly, every other area of content that we touch on has got to be bound in research. We've got to know that what we're doing, that there's evidence that says it's good. It's not just me sitting back and going, oh, this sounds like fun. None of that. <laughs> it's digging into the research, which happens to be fun for me, though, to be quite honest. And then providing training and technical assistance. And so we provide trainings. We do face-to-face -face trainings. We might use technology because it's hard sometimes for our educators to get out and travel, depending upon the size of the, or location of their district. We also have online training modules, and you'll see a list of topics that, we'll, that we can share with you. But the technical <coughs> assistance piece is really important, too. If a district is doing a self-assessment on their transition IEP, what is showing up that is the problem, and how can we help them, either through training or being there with them to evaluate, to give them the assistance that they need to improve their outcomes for our students. So, Interagency collaboration, this is exciting. We provide mini grant funding for a couple of different things. One of which is for interagency council activities. And so we've had a nice increase this year. We process provided 42 mini grants that are serving 49 of our 67 school districts right now. And those are the ones that show up officially. I know from experience, we've got folks that may not be formally on the list of districts that they serve, but they'll come. Like in the Panhandle, Panhandle Area Education Consortium at Fiddlers in Chipley serves eight districts, including Washington. But I know three other districts come on a regular basis. Gadsden even comes all the way over to Chipley, which is Washington County, I don't know if that makes 
Well, there's a map in there. But just to say that folks travel far and wide and share resources. So this is just what we know from our applications. I know by personal experience that it's even more so. So that we're excited about that increase. And the reason that we're excited about it is, again, the importance of our interagency council adult service providers meeting with our educators that are serving our students in the school and helping them make those vital connections. You move from entitlement in the school system to determining eligibility once you graduate and they're in the adult world. So everything that we can do to help our teachers prepare our students and families for that transition, the better off we all are. Now this, out of all 67 districts at one point in time, 61 of the 67 districts have been a connect site over the years. So it ebbs and flows a little bit as to whether, sometimes what we notice is if we have a tr change in a transition contact or an ESC director, there may be, um, we need to reconnect with them so that the next person can take on the mini grant and lead the interagency council. Yes, sir. Um, all of this map, I got that. Uh, all the map of people with dead or burn up or mental, well, for a content size about, about the people, with people in the border, and then uh, all over the south. So this content with people in, inside the map. Mm -hmm. And if I understood you correctly, you're talking about that there's a lot of people in these various places throughout the state of Florida and that we look at in this map. Good observation. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm sorry, but what does connect? And oh, just making that connection. I don't know how that terminology okay. came about, and it's even before Project 10. Okay. But I think it literally talks about connecting other stakeholders on behalf of students okay. with disabilities. So would that be the school district? Oh, so, um, so let's talk about who sits at the table. It could be the transition specialist. Some schools have employment specialists. Project 10 representative, other discretionary project folks might be at the table. Um, business leadership from, from the local community. Um, who else? Other agencies. Yeah, other agencies, Voc Rehab, Center for Independent Living, Easter Seals, just depends on who's you know, in that general area. But it can pull from multi-districts or in a large district, it may be pulling from multiple agencies within that one district. So does this, is the school system leader or is someone from Project 10? Like oh, good question. It is not a Project 10 person. We okay. contribute, we're one of the participants. Okay. It would, it's most often the transition contact in the district. Okay. So every one of our districts has someone that's in charge of secondary transition. In our small and rural districts, it might also be a director. Okay. Or in our large districts, it may be multiple people. Yeah, with those large districts, I'm trying to find a With your regional transition yeah. rep that you can get from here. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> good, good, good. Wonderful. And you have a Well, that was my same question. I know we used to have one in Duval, and uh, I don't think it's there anymore, so. Well, and we had some changes in yes. Duval, too. Yeah. That's a perfect example. But we know that things are coming back around. So it's a lot of times when you have initiatives and then there's a big change in the leadership, it takes a little bit of time to reestablish and make those connections again. So. But the project and person does not lead the meeting. No, okay. no. Now, whether someone might step in and help out right. in okay. change or if someone is absent and they ask them to fill in, but it's not the, it's not the project 10 person's role. And you can see where that could be a challenge. Here in the Panhandle, we talk about Washington serving multiple districts and Tallahassee working with Leon Gadsden and McCullough. But over here, these are all individuals, um, individual interagency councils. So there's not, but you can see the way the Panhandle is, you kind of have to share. You got to come together. It's so stretched out. And, but here, those are all separate interagency councils and separate mini grants going there.
And there's our mention of Judy. <laughs> Monica, our bureau chief, has just joined us. So thanks for joining us. And we were talking about Judy, our liaison, and how closely we work with her on the development and vetting of all of our materials and training, and website content. And then student development and outcomes. I think you get a better idea when you look at our list of trainings when I mentioned employability skills. One of the things we know from research is students with disabilities, they might be able to learn the necessary job skills, but what might be some of the other issues the student has that could be a detriment in the workplace? Accepting criticism, collaboration with their peers, and we call those the soft skills. And so there's some great resources that go along with teaching soft skills that will alert you to as well. Self-determination, self-advocacy, those are huge. So when we look at student development and outcomes, what are those things that we know based on um, research, evidence-based practices that are going to provide our students with the greatest possible outcomes? And again, this topic can give you an idea here. So we, today is our overview, but successful grant writing, art thread work of art is a very exciting training and resource and partnership that we have. And we worked very hard early on with our DJJ folks, because you can imagine there are youth with disabilities in facilities, in residential facilities. There's not always the greatest amount of resources or opportunities for expressing oneself, artistically, perhaps. The beauty of the art thread work of art is it is internet-based. It's a very exciting, powerful online tool. But we've got kids in DJJ facilities. Are they allowed to be online? So we had to do a lot of coordinating and build in practices within the art thread and the training to make sure that any art that was created is first vetted. And so we did our teacher training, and then we have another component of that training that teaches them what to look for in art because of gang symbols and signs. And then, let me ask you this, does it make sense if I'm a regional transition representative that I approve all the art that's going on, or does that teacher know better what's going on in that classroom to know whether or not something's, oh, well, he did that because of it. I wouldn't know that. So we're very intentional about our training and the support that we provide, and also knowing when to leave it to the teacher at that facility, for example. Who knows better what's going on than I would, just because I might be the regional transition rep. We see all the art that comes in, and we can go to each, um, we can go to the website and identify what art is happening in each of our regions too, which is very cool. Um, community-based instruction under development, community resource mapping, what's available in our community? Are we fully real, using everything that is there? Sometimes you have to step back and do an inventory, if you will. And that's a great um, training or practice, if you will, or activity exercise for our interagency council folks. Discovery process, I talked a little bit about that already. But again, with customized employment as an outcome. And Lisa's our in-house expert, and she's working on a statewide level with some of our folks on the salary. And dropout prevention. So this training started out as reporting Florida's current status at an educational strategies conference years ago. But what did we learn from the feedback that we received? They wanted more strategies. So we responded by adding part two strategies and we tried to capture what was going on throughout the state and then link it with what we know is best practice at a national level. And I talked to you about our interagency councils. So when a new council comes on board, we provide these trainings with them, although this focus group training is basically conducting focus groups at the school. So anybody could have that training. And intro to secondary transition planning, Huge popular training, school-based micro-enterprise development. We talked about the importance of, of work experience and gaining those skills. The school-based micro-enterprise training helps do that. Service learning. So the difference between service learning and volunteerism is what? It's tying 
what's going on in service learning to the curriculum. It's not volunteering and then returning and going back to the same thing. There's a purpose for it. We're studying science, biology, pollution. We're going out, we're going to do a clean up. Now we're going to come back and we're going to apply what we learned and it all relates. So that's the big difference between service learning and volunteers. Standing up for me, we talked about self-determination skills. So there's an entire curriculum that starts at pre-K, intermediate, middle, and high. So it goes through the age ranges. And so there's age-appropriate activities and lesson plans that take our students all the way up through high school. Summary performance. This is a really important piece when youth are making that move, that transition from high school to college or university, or even career technical education. It answers some of the questions such as, what is going to help me be most successful in a post-secondary education setting? What kind of accommodations do I need? What are my post-school goals, post-secondary goals anyway? What is it that I want to do? And so that tool helps youth articulate that information. Transition assessment is huge. How are we going to know what someone wants to do when they graduate if, and what they might have interest in if we're not doing assessment along the way? And Transition Basics, a guide for families, a very popular training that we've collaborated with a number of um, family network on disabilities, for example, just different projects that we've tried, um, collaborated with. Using school level data increase success of our students with disabilities. That is the training and technical assistance that I refer to when we go down to the school level with the principal. We want to teach them to fish. We're going to show you how to use your data, identify students by various risk factors, and help you identify who needs some help in order for them to graduate with their peers. And then utilizing data to diagnose and then treat. So that training, we're going to revise that because a little bit of our focus on our indicators has changed. And so we're going to update that training to come along. We're in a constant state of development and update, so. Ah, scope and sequences. So these are actual courses that teachers, from which teachers can select. And so the scope and sequence says, if you're going to teach this content, over this amount of time, what are some skills or activities that you can do? And then here are some resources. And so we just finished the self-determination and updated it to include self-advocacy that was added to legislation. And I mentioned our online training modules. Graduation requirements, we're very excited about this one. We work with Florida Center for Interactive Media out of Florida State University. So we develop content and they put it into the online module. And so right now we have folks reviewing, previewing, and giving us feedback on that online module. So we're getting very close to releasing that, which will be very timely. And the other thing that we're doing too is we've got this content. We already have a face-to-face -face training for this, but these two, um, recently were converted over so that we can do face-to-face. -face. We want to offer the same face-to-face -face as we have available online. So then that gives us an opportunity to update this content too. And these are available to anyone. Go to our website, there's an online training tab, and you just use your email address to log in. No crazy passwords to try to remember. Yay! <laughs> and our topical briefs. These have been a lot of fun for us because we started out, I think, with like a Word document many moons ago, and then we discovered constant contact from our partners with SEDNET. And it just looks so much more inviting, and it's been really fun to work on, and it's our way of trying to get content and information to our educators and administrators and other stakeholders in a very inviting, fun, resourceful way. So we've really enjoyed working on those, too. And actually, you have the latest edition from oh, thanks April, you. actually not the latest, but April, a couple months ago, an independent living, and it's in um, black and white, so it's a little boring, but you'll want to view it online because all the links are live, so you can 
If you want to know more about that resource, you can click right to it. And that brings us to the website um, because you can subscribe to join our mailing list and receive these in your mailbox at least once a month. Sometimes we'll have special editions and have more than once a month. And um, and you can read back issues. So say you just joined now, you want to see what else is out there, they're on our website. And I'm moving forward one website, yep. So that's what it looks like. And you'll see right on the home page, um, Project 10 Topical Briefs. You'll also see what's new. So if, you, if you're if you a frequent visitor, you can see some of the highlights of things that visitors would be interested in. Any new um, updates from the Florida Department of Education, any national updates, local, um, upcoming transition related events it's all there for you we try to make the goal of this website from day one has to make to make it uh, user friendly for everybody so um, district people state people parents students teachers everyone and being that we've, we've been pretty successful I think uh, I might be a little partial I started working on this on the website from day one so it's really near and dear, but I've had really great feedback, and we've had over one million visitors, one million visitors, <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's old enough to know that reference. Um, and we have over about 4,500 a month, and I'm hoping to see a spike because I've talked to amazing folks in the exhibit hall for the last two days, and actually, these are the most frequently visited sites, and they're really relevant to you all as parents and family members, and also the district staff here as well. Um, the A to Z Library of Contents is kind of like a thesaurus dictionary, but then it has libraries to further reading. So if you, we use a lot of uh, buzzwords here in education, and if you want to know any that are specific transition related, you can go there and learn more. We also have um, district resources, which is extremely helpful. Our, our, our RTRs, Regional Transition Representatives, live and work in their regions and they try really hard to keep everything updated so when you click on your a district that you want to know more about you'll find the local educational agency the esc director the transition contact all of those folks that you'll, you're going to want to know um, not, not just their name their email and their phone number and then you'll have an employment section so your rehab contacts and other um, career source for that local region and then there's a local community section, so leisure and rec activities and, and organizations. So we try to make it really user friendly for everybody. We also have the BEES TAPS technical assistant papers and memos, all um, chronological. So anytime there's new TAPS coming out, you can guarantee if they're transition related, they'll be on our website with the newest at the top. And financial resources is a popular one, and we have both student scholarships on there and then teacher and district scholarships as well. And training, and, and Dr. Versi had talked a lot about the available training. We have both our online modules and our training that we can come and do. Another part that you'll find on our website is uh, information on Project 10 Stingray. So Stingray stands for Students Transitioning into the Next Generation, Recognizing Alternatives for Youth. And it was started in 2010, and it was a partnership with Pinellas County School District, and being at USF St. Pete, that is our local school district. Of course, USF St. Pete, and um, the Florida Department of Education, and what was formerly the Governor's Florida Governor's Commission on Disabilities, decided to start a pilot proje project on inclusive higher education for in students with intellectual disabilities. So we're looking at students 18 to 22. We're currently a one-to-one -one partnership with Pinellas County Schools, so all the students in our program are extended transition students. And we're offering um, the opportunity to go to college with the end goal of employment. So they get the college experience, making friends, getting connected to the community, um, auditing a course of their, of their interest and also that relates to their employment goal. And really just developing their circle of support as a young person, being with their peers that have all graduated and going on to college. And you'll hear the fun stuff about it from Demetrius. I'm just saying the technical stuff. Yeah, we'll go to the next. So here's some, some stats. We current, we're in our fifth year, as I mentioned. We started in the middle of the spring in 2010. We have 10 students. We started with five in 2010, so we doubled in size. We've offer, we offer on and off campus internships. So from the very beginning, when they walk into our, onto our campus, the um, focus is getting ready for work. So
So we start with on-campus internships, they get acclimated to the campus, um, really find their way, build some really great skills, and then the next semester they move off campus to, to find some jobs. They've audited over 30 classes, and it's probably closer to 40 now, and, and Demetrius will talk about his classes, but they've taken everything from intro to anthropology to contemporary social problems, um, self and society. We've got we've had some amazing artists, so all the modern art classes that you could ask for. What any other highlights that you can think of the mm -hmm. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Thank you, friends took Spanish one and two, uh, Francophone World. We had a student who's actually going to Paris this summer and she took French in high school, so she didn't want French one and two, she's already done that. So she took one on um, French culture across the, the world and uh, in other French-speaking countries. So that was really neat. Spanish. Speech. Speech. Um, yeah, beginning speech or public speaking. A lot of our students take that. And we just got a university experience class as part of our university, which was primarily commuter, um, especially back in 2010. We're really, we have a new strategic plan on our campus, so we're really um, building in the freshman experience, so that really benefits our students um, because several of them have taken the university success class. It's been awesome. They are also expected to direct their own IEPs, so self-directed IEPs, and that's a really cool opportunity for us at Project 10 because that's what we're helping to build capacity across the state, and then in our own backyard, we see our students directing their own IEPs and developing uh, um, PowerPoints to frame and, and guide their whole IEP, or Prezi's too. And so um, they've just been fantastic. And actually the, the um, Stingray Current, which is the student authored newsletter that's also a handout, talks a little bit about that and um, the steps that they follow and to prepare for that. They're also involved on campus, and I, don't, I won't steal your thunder, I'll, I'll, I'll just freeze on it. But they have a, the Bull Buds, there's a student develop, a Stingray developed club, but it is inclusive. Um, not all the students in Stingray are in the club, but several of them are in leadership positions. And they've actually been nominated for a ton of awards at the Rockies last year, which is this uh, student award like Emmy Knight. And they've done, they really fat filled a gap on our campus um, in terms of community service. A lot of uh, other student organizations were, you know, helping the environment or doing stuff related to education, but Bull Buds fills the gap and brings um, a collaborative effort for community service onto our campus. So they've been recognized by the Chancellor and as a, a really awesome organization for the whole USF system, which is huge. We're also in the process of applying for the Comprehensive Transition Program for the USF system which would allow us to expand program inclusive higher ed programs and also allow students to apply using the FAFSA, the free, what does it stand for? Free Application for Financial Student Aid, um, where they can get scholarship money to attend these programs. And that will really help with the independent living piece, um, which we talked about in the roof presentation earlier. And we have the Project Sale, uh, which is student successful, uh, I forget the acronym. Um, it's a summer residential pilot that we're going to try to aim for next year. So we have lots of dorm space in the summer when the majority of our students leave. And so really getting some independent living experience and programs for our students over the summer. Oh, and so I'm going to go back one and then you can talk about your experience in Stingray? Yes. Okay. Oh. All right. So my Experience in Stingray is um, I help the students to ride the bus, and it's called PSCA. PSCA stands for Pinellas, Pinellas, Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority, and I joined the track committee. And track is Transit Riders Advisory Committee. So I go every Tuesday um, each month. And some for Project 10, I did for my two inter three internships is Fairmont Park, the YWCA, 
and Project 10 office. And I've done one job, academic advice, and I get paid $10 an hour. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm getting a, another real job at Publix coming soon. Can I talk a little bit more about the Academic Advising Center? So um, one of our former students, uh, Larissa, a couple years older than Demetrius, or started a couple years earlier, she got had this on-campus internship at the Academic Advising Center, and she was doing a great job, so much so that they put um, information about Stingray on their website, which was confusing for parents and students, because I was getting a ton of calls about academic advising, and I'm thinking, like, why am I getting these calls? Um, but because they thought so much of Larissa and uh, her colleagues and the program, they just really wanted to put the word out there about this program. They hired Larissa. She actually had the opportunity to go to a project search site, which just started last year in Pinellas County. But they said, well, we're losing Larissa, but we have this position. Could Larissa train one of us? Is there another student in Stingray that would like this opportunity? So enters Demetrius, who had already been um, uh, an office intern in the Project 10 office, helping us with filing and shipping and all kinds of things. Data so, entry. Data entry. Oh yeah, our evaluations that you guys are going to fill out positively later. <laughs> um, we have students um, entering that data. So Demetrius got amazing at sending emails and, and doing tallying and um, typing up all the, com the wonderful comments. And so. Um, so Larissa actually had a few weeks before she was going to start with um, Project Search, so she was actually able to train Demetrius, and he walked right into an on-campus paid job, so he's actually a U.S. Auth employee with a U.S. Auth employee number and all those perks, and a sweet paycheck as well. Um, for my classes I took is intro to teach my like, full students. And my other class is race, gender, class, and media. Hmm. And as part of your, you did several courses in the College of Education. Yes. And you did a practic, like a internship practicum at the Fairmont Park, is in. Yeah, it's at Fairmont Park. I volunteer like an hour with different students. Like I did um, pre-K. The little kids, hello, and they miss me so much. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm doing volunteer at the YWCA with the pre-K kids again, and the two-year-olds, how to read, how to do art and stuff. Uh, talk about a little bit of uh, Bulbas and your involvement on campus. Oh. Bulbas is when we join like community service, like feed the homeless, um, go out and help other organizations of like different clubs of the USF. And this year, I mean next year, we probably have it more fun because they want me back <laughs> to help them out. We probably go out by somewhere like one Saturday and go bowling. And I know you were president last year, so that involved like renting space on campus, making an agenda. Uh, what else did that involve? What leadership skills did you learn? Um, I do my, like write notes, write my agenda, see what I'm going to say, and do like selections about who going to be the president, who going to be the vice president, the treasurer, the secretary. Um, do you want to talk about any of your mentors, academic, social? Or peer mentor? Um, my mentor, Eric, <laughs> it was in my class, at, when I was during the class, and he helped me prepare a prezi for my class. 
and for intro to teach, I had Julie that helped me write notes and put it on the PowerPoint. And so our students are supported um, because it's an inclusive program. Instead of having a bunch of us around, <laughs> for lack of a better word, um, we believe that students learn best from their peers. So we hire a lot of students, and we also have a lot of students from the College of Education, like Julie is a College of Education student, um, and then other volunteers to support our students in, in several different ways. They have academic mentors, which is Eric and Julie, is who you were talking about, that are actually in the courses with the students. They're students that were already going to take the course, and um, we match them up. And we've, we haven't done the formal study, but we find that the students who are academic mentors do really well in their classes, too, because they're really spending extra time to talk about um, the content outside of class and so they meet in the library and um, in a coffee shop to discuss notes and um, you know uh, look at some of the assignments and things of that nature and then we have community mentors who and, and there's not many of those maybe um, three or four and they span across all ten of our students and they meet the students where they are and work on things outside of campus um, on, in the independent living piece. So everything from um, you know, managing your debit card, setting up a student account uh, on campus, um, finding the right cell phone plan, um, looking at if some, if some of our students want to get a driver's license or maybe have a permit and need to make the next step. So just things in the community. So there, it's very individualized. And then we do some reflection activities with, um, I, with iPad apps. So instead of writing a reflection, we do like pictures and then narration with it. It's really neat. Um, and then we have peer mentors, which are, it's, it's the fun stuff, it's lunch, it's hanging out in the student rec center, it's getting coffee, it's um, going to see a movie. So just pairing students with similar interests. And a lot of times they help the students get involved in other um, student organizations. And, and I know we've worked a lot with student government this year has been involved. And Quan's on student government, isn't he one of our students? Didn't he join student government this year? Um, yeah. Because his mentor was like student body vice president and really got him in the process. And I think Abby is too now that I say that. So just really um, getting into the meat of what it means to be a college student and get involved in your community. And I mean, I, I couldn't teach that. So <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's the best way they learn is from their peers. And who become friends, I mean, mentors who become friends. Anything else you want to add about students? Do you want to talk about um, so you became involved on track, and we have, you are a second year student this year, but we had first year students who were a little scared to ride the public uh, bus. So Demetrius helped, and what did you do to help with that? Um, how I help is like ask them for the address and look on the map to see what bus does go to the house. Then, me and Nancy ride the bus with them. The, the ride the bus like three times, and then let them try their own, see how they feel to ride the bus for themselves. What about when you brought the bus to campus? Um, I asked PSA to bring a big harbor bus. So they can teach, so they can see how they can slide their card in, how they put the money in the the box, and how they can pull the bell to for the stuff. So you schedule a whole bus, I mean, and so imagine a bus coming off the bus stop to like right near where their, um, where Ms. Johnson's office is and um, have this whole simulation of what it's like to ride the bus, you know, all the logistics, of having your car ready and your change ready and what if you have a bike and how to put it on the front, getting on, getting off, um, all of those logistic things that you don't think about until you're doing it. So that was really cool. And to be did that single-handedly, I couldn't believe it when PSTA, this huge bus, hybrid bus pulled up. That was really neat. And I know that you also kind of keep a lookout for some of our new bus riders. You meet them, when they know, you know when they're coming through that main hub. And if they're not on time, you're alerting somebody that, hey, where is so-and-so? 
So that's a really cool network that I think that you guys have going on as second year students. And plus, I was on Beatles and I'm talking about PSD. Sure, yeah. Do you, you want me to talk about that? Sure. Okay. So speaking of uh, Dimitri's involvement with PSTA, we were having a new student orientation in May, and um, we asked Dimitri to coordinate some, some activities with PSTA to really help our brand new students and their families to know that you know it, it is an expectation for our students to um, travel independently. And what better way than we already have this advisory committee member who's very active and connected, and, and we're going to do the simulation. Well, PSTA was so impressed that they called the, the news channel and wanted to do a story on it. And so our local news channel, Bay News 9, came out and interviewed Demetrius and the PSTA folks about the whole thing. And they came out two different days, both just to talk with Demetrius about his experiences and then also on the actual day when, when the bus came. So they thought it was a pretty big deal and pretty cool that you were doing all of that. Anything else? Any questions? Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us. This is your what now? We were adding the number of presentations. What is it? Six? Six. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. And the last two are better in that. Class on giving speeches. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, next definitely. Well, I'm on making things to me. He's out there advocating for others. Yes. Hi, I'm Miss Monica. That's great work that you're doing, especially with the transportation, because mm -hmm. it's so important that everybody knows how to use public transportation. 